Christmas for me, before I became a Christian, was, was really all about the wonder of it. I, I remember as a kid, it was about the wonder of it. There's the decorations and the, the presents. There's the family gathering together and the presents. And, and then there's the, the, the songs and the Christmas carols and, of course, the presents. I mean, that's what my childhood, that's what I remember. Um, even as a teenager and young adult, though I remember the, just the wonder of Christmas was the traditions and that we would gather together as a whole family and that you knew what to expect and you knew we were going to take part in the things we did every year and there was just such joy in that. Since I've become a Christian, Christmas is not all about me. <laughs> it's about the Savior that was born. And, and there's a whole different sense of um, the importance of Christmas. All of a sudden, I was noticing the words to those Christmas hymns and Christmas carols that I'd always sung, but now I was paying attention to the world. The words, peace on earth, or about this, this holy night. Those things took on a whole different meaning because I knew who it was who laid in that manger. I knew who that baby was and it was God incarnate. And all of a sudden, it's not just about the wonder and the sounds and the familiar tunes, but it was about worship. And that's really what changed when I became a Christian as I began to see the worship in Christmas. When I got to see the video that Thomas made for us of, of Tom Green sharing his story, I said, I know Thomas said, are all those pictures of that little guy in there, is that Tom when he was a little kid? He said, yeah, those are all Tom's pictures when he was a kid there. Uh, Tom, when he came to Shoreline Church, was a, in the tech world working for Oracle, and now he's come on as our adult spiritual formation director and is helping develop opportunities for us as adults to keep growing spiritually. So pray for Tom in that role and also get to know him. He's just a, a great, great brother. Uh, in this series we're in right now, Vintage Christmas, we're actually... Seeking to kind of come to the Christmas moment that we're in right now. And this is this whole month we're celebrating Christmas as a church. And we're going to be looking at Jesus, what it's all about. And we're coming to Christmas today. But we're saying, but there is also kind of vintage Christmas. We, we look back when, to your childhood. Like Tom's pictures when he was a kid. I remember that's a vintage Christmas looking back to the, those childhood years. And you can look back 100 years. But if you look back 2,000 years, that's a real vintage Christmas. That's when Jesus came. So you might think, well, the ultimate vintage Christmas is 2,000 years ago when Jesus first came. And it is, in a sense, but there's Christmas before that Christmas. You say, well, how can you have Christmas before Jesus came? Well, because even before that, the prophets were prophesying, saying a Messiah would come. They were pointing to the coming Messiah. So you have our life vintage Christmases. You have the first vintage Christmas when Jesus came in Bethlehem, was born, God among us. But if you go earlier, you see the prophets pointing ahead. And what we're going to look at today is actually the prophet Nathan, who was a prophet in King David's court. And Nathan is speaking, pointing to David as the king, David as, as, as a king, as a significant king. But ultimately in this prophecy, he's pointing to the messianic king, to Jesus coming a thousand years later. So our vintage Christmas today is 3,000 years ago. All right, and if you have, if you have, if you have your Bibles, uh, you, you can turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 7, or in your Bible app, you can go to 2, cha 2 Samuel chapter 7. We'll get to that in just a moment, but you can turn there, 2 Samuel 7. But what's happening in this passage, and, I, and this, we're going to get kind of a, I want you to really kind of lean in and follow what's going on here, because there's a lot happening in this passage, all right? There, there's what, what uh, scholars would call foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is saying something that the average you know, listener would hear and go, oh, I know what's coming next. They'd say something that was kind of pointing to something else. And in the ancient world, there were times with, when, when prophets would say things that would not just be about their moment, but it would foreshadow something that was coming later. And if you're not sure what that means, I'll give you some modern day examples of foreshadowing, okay? Foreshadowing is when somebody says something and you in your mind go, I know where this is going. I know what, I, I kind of have a sense of what comes next. So here's one. If you hear somebody begin a story with these words, once upon a time. If somebody says to you, I want to tell you a story, once upon a time, what do you expect to come next? Princesses, 
Frogs that used to be a prince that if you kiss them, they turn into a prince. I mean, if you hear once upon a time, you expect certain things. If you hear somebody say once upon a time, and they start giving you math equations, you're going to say, I just got ripped off. You started with once upon a time. That's supposed to go somewhere. And if you start with once upon a time, it used to be before our world became really fatalistic and every story and every movie is grim and dark. It used to be, if you started a story once upon a time, it would usually end like this. And they lived... How do you know that? Foreshadowing. Okay, when you say once upon a time, everybody following? You say one thing and your brain kind of goes, I know what comes next. I'll give you another one. Give you another one. If, if, If you go to the movies... And scrolling across the screen with epic music playing in the background are these words. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. What do you expect? You expect Sith Lords and Jedi and epic space battles. If, if, if it begins with a scroll a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and then there's, like, like, like there's frolicking kittens playing. Now, you may love frolicking kittens, but you're going to go, that doesn't follow a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Everybody following me? That's foreshadowing. When you say something, the people in that culture at that time kind of know where you're going. I'll give you a practical, real-life foreshadowing. A dad's at home, and he's kind of taking care of the kids. Honey, don't worry. He says to his wife, go out, have a nice time with your friends. What could go wrong? I'll be in charge. And she comes home. Why are you laughing at that? And she, and, and she comes home from her fun night with her girlfriends and they had a great time. And, and her husband says to her, honey, um, do you want to hear the good news or the bad news first? That's called foreshadowing, right? If somebody says to you, if somebody says to you, do you want to hear the good news or the bad news first? What are they setting up for? Bad news. They're saying, I'll do it in the order you want, but ultimately I got some bad news for you. That's foreshadowing. Are we following? So now... Now we turn back a thousand years BC, all right, a thousand years before Jesus came. David, David of David and Goliath, King David is king. Nathan is one of the primary prophets at that time among the people of Israel. So here's what happens God speaks to Nathan, Nathan speaks to David. It's recorded talking about David's kingship. It starts to point, foreshadowing Solomon, David's son's kingship, but also it's foreshadowing a thousand years later, the coming of the Messiah. So look for that as we read God's word together. Get get the sense of all this coming together. So every text has a context. This right here we're going to read is a message from God to Nathan the prophet to David for us. So kind of follow that chain reaction as we read together from 2 Samuel 7 beginning in verse 8. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. So who's speaking? God. Who is he talking to? Nathan. And he's saying, we'll see at the end, it's Nathan. And he's telling Nathan, you're going to tell this to David, all right? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you, David, I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. David, you were an ordinary shepherd kid, and I made you king. So he's reminding him, so now now kingship comes up, David's kingship. You're going to see multiple kingships here, and ultimately the foreshadowing of the coming king of kings and lord of lords, all right? I appointed you ruler over my people Israel. Verse 9, I have been with you wherever you have gone. So God's speaking through Nathan and reminding David, I've been with you everywhere you've gone. I've cut off all your enemies before you. In the ancient world, there were lots of enemies. They were deadly. And God says, I cut them off. I I dealt with them. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. You know, a, no, a place with peace where they live. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. That's been an embattled place of the world ever since to this day today. And then he says, I will give you rest from all your enemies. In the ancient world, that's good news. Okay, I'm going to give you a rest. So this is sort of a Davidic promise, a promise to David about his kingship, about a sense of peace while David is king. But David's not going to be king forever. He's going to come to the end of his life. So it continues on. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors. Translated what? When you are dead. All right? When your days are over, you rest with your ancestors. Is a poetic, nice way of saying when you die. All right? So he says, when you die, there's going to be another king. 
but he's not talking about the Messiah yet. He's talking about his son Solomon, who will build the temple. All right? So you have to kind of follow. God is speaking to Nathan. Nathan's talking to David. He's telling David about his own kingship, but about coming kingships. All right? And so when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. That's Solomon. Solomon will become the third king of Israel. Saul was first, David was second, Solomon's third. So David's own bloodline is going to continue on with Solomon. All right? I will, it says, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, uh, succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And Solomon was the one who built the temple. All right? So this is prophetic. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. His kingdom forever. Pause there a minute. Forever? That's a long time. Is Solomon going to live forever? What's the answer? No. So now, now the foreshadowing begins. Now, so what's happening is he's talking about, Saul, he's talking about David. He's talking about Solomon. But he's going to start kind of pointing, foreshadowing another king. A king of all kings. A king whose kingdom will last forever and ever. Who's that? That's Jesus. We might, if you were just reading this, you might not notice it. If you were in the ancient world, it would be just like somebody saying, if somebody saying to you, you know, once upon a time. You'd have certain things that come to your mind. When people start talking about the kingdom that lasts forever, they start thinking about the Messiah who will be coming. Verse 14, let's continue on. So God says, I will be his father and he will be my son. Now he's, talk, you know, he's talking here about Solomon specifically. And he says, when he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it from Saul, who was the first king and blew it, whom I removed from before you. So now God's pointing back to Saul. He messed up. It's David now. And then Solomon will come. He's in all of his wisdom. Solomon made some really dumb choices. You can read it all in the Bible. It's fascinating stuff. But, but then, all right, verse 16. He says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Oh, wait a minute now. The so the final word is this. David, you're going to come and you're going to go. You've been, you've been a, a solid king. David made his own mistakes. By the way, every king made mistakes. Human beings. He says, but Solomon will come and after him, a kingdom will come that will endure forever. Now they ended up waiting close to a thousand years for that to be a reality. But that's how prophecy worked. It was pointing ahead to what was next. Look at verse 17. And this is how you know that it was God speaking to Nathan. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. So God speaks to the prophet Nathan. Nathan prophesies and speaks to David. David hears a message about his own kingship, a foreshadowing of Solomon's kingship, and then a long-term pointing to a final king whose kingdom will last how long? Forever. Okay, that's the Messiah. That's Jesus. So let's do this. Let's look at Christmas then. We're going back now 2,000 years. To what people would have known in the first century when Jesus came and going back to the prophecies that pointed to the coming of Jesus. Okay, Christmas then. Let's look at David and his kingship. David was a great ruler of the people. Verse 8 says this. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. So David became a king. David became a ruler. There was a kingship because what we're looking at is the comparison between King David, a king, to King Jesus, the king. King David was what? A king. Say it with me. A king of many kings. King Jesus is the king, right? David was a king. Jesus is the king. And so it's pointing to the ultimate coming of the king, all right? And so David was remembered as the archetypical good king. And you say, well, if I know David's story, if I remember it well, he messed up. David messed up. He, he sinned pretty big time. And yet he was called a man after God's own heart. Can I tell you something as a pastor and as a Christian, what an encouragement that is for me? That God said, I can use somebody like David who sinned big time and repented. Read Psalm 51. His prayer of confession and repentance is heartbreaking. He knew he blew it. And he came back to God. And our God is a God of grace. If you've, if you've 
excluded yourself from ever serving Jesus. Today we're going to have a celebration of our volunteers and we're going to have a time where our volunteers are going to be served today and get a, you know, have a special time. That's what, that's what's set about in the courtyard there for a big volunteer lunch. If, if, if you're not volunteering and serving Jesus because you've messed up in your life and God can't use someone like you, read the story of David. God can use someone like you. You know how I know that? Because God can use someone like me. And I've messed up a lot. You say, Pastor, what's your mess up been? None of your business. I can't believe you'd ask that. It's very, it's very offensive and hurtful that you would say that. No. But if, you dig, if we dig deep enough into any of our lives, guess who's disqualified? Everybody. If we come with the grace of God and the grace of Jesus, guess who can be qualified to serve him? Everybody. All right? Keep our hearts in the right place. That's Christmas then. Christmas then. David saw God's hand of protection. And again, we're looking at David as a king. We're going to look in a minute at Jesus as the king. But let's, let's linger back here in the Old Testament. Let's linger with David for a moment here. Christmas then, David saw God, uh, God's hand of protection. Verse 9 says this, I have been with you wherever you've gone. I've cut off all your enemies from before you. God said, I protected you. I watched over you. At the end of verse 10, if you jump ahead to the end of this, it says, wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning. God says, I'll protect you. So God delivered David again and again and again. I remember the first time I read through the Bible, I was just a brand new Christian. I was 15 years old, almost 16 years old. And I started in the Old Testament. So I walked through David's story. Now this guy got in, in, this guy had so many times he almost got killed, got cornered, got trapped in a cave, had enemies coming against him. One time he's got to act like he's crazy because the, the enemy people that he's trying to hide among, he realizes they're going to kill him. So he acts like, and he just, and yet, I read it as, as this young Christian and saw that God save him and God save him and God save him. And I, I thought David was not that clever. David was not that smart. God's hand was on him. So again and again and again, God delivered David. What a great message that is. Christmas then, God made David's name great. God made his name great. Look at verse nine of 2 Samuel, chapter seven, verse nine. It says, I'll be with you wherever you have gone and I've cut off your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great like the gr names of the greatest men on earth. We can't understand in our culture today, your name's your name. You know, you might have some family history. Kevin Garth Harney, that's my name. Kevin Garth Harney. Kevin, where's that come from? Well, that's kind of an Irish favorite, I guess. Garth, named after my uncle, who I never met because he was my dad's younger brother, died in his teens in a car accident. So I was named after him, Harney. I'm not even a Harney. I don't have any blood, hardly blood in me. I'm a McGargy by blood. But my grandfather died before, when my dad was young, as a drunk. Basically killed himself with alcohol. Fourth or fifth generation in a row in my family. Sad story. But, I, but my dad's stepfather, who never adopted me, my dad gave me his name. So there's a story behind my name. But if you say, Kevin, is your name great? I go, it's a, it's a good name. It's a, it's a name. But in the ancient world, your name meant everything. And, and so, so it says that... God's going to make David's name great, remembered, a memorable name, a name of historic significance. Again, each time we look at David, remember, he's a king. In a minute, we're going to look at the king. And all these things continue to be through, through the generations, right? And so David was known and remembered as a good and great king. And in the ancient world, a name matters. Christmas then. God used David to make a home for his people. Verse 10, and I will provide a place for my people. I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. People try to oppress them, but I'm going to watch over them. I'm going to give them a place to live. In the ancient world, a home, a piece of land meant everything. And God said, through David, I'm going to give my people a place to be. The land and safety of God's people expanded under David. In David's kingship, the land was safer. The land expanded under David's kingship. That's part of what, what a king could do in the ancient world. Christmas then, David's offspring would be flawed people until the final king came. His offspring would be flawed, would be imperfect. Solomon, who would follow him, would be a flawed person, just like David was flawed, just like you're flawed, just like I'm flawed. So the Lord himself will establish a house for you when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors. David, when you pass away, another one's going to come. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. And yet, we find out that Solomon came under God's judgment also because of his imperfections, because of his rebellion at times. So a great king, a good king, an imperfect king, right? Many came under God's firm discipline. When you read through the kings of Israel, when they messed up, God loved them enough to discipline them. This is something our culture doesn't get today in many, many homes and many places. If I love my child... I would never punish them. I would never discipline them. That would, that would break their spirit. Wrong. 
You want to destroy a child, give them no boundaries. Let them turn into wild little beasts. So, pastor, I disagree with you. That's okay. But I'm telling you, I've been a pastor a long time. I've watched lots of people. No, I'm not talking about abuse. I'm not talking about overdoing it. But if you love, you know, I'm, I'm meditating on a passage right now out of the book of Hebrews that's all about how God disciplines those he loves. When someone truly loves you and they see you do, doing something stupid, dangerous, irresponsible, immoral, you love enough to say, that's wrong. And you set boundaries up. And so, and so, so God is a God who, who chooses to do that for those he loves. So Christmas then, David promised uh, that his offspring would be king. Uh, the final then, David was, pro- uh, was promised that one of his offspring would become king of an eternal kingdom. And here's the key. Here's the foreshadowing piece. 2 Samuel 7, 16. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Forever. That's a long time. That's beyond time, right? This was a clear foreshadowing of the coming messianic king. And somebody listening to this prophecy would have said, this is, he's not talking about David anymore. He's not talking about Solomon anymore. He's talking about the king, the Messiah, that the people were waiting for and longing for and praying for and hoping for all the way down to Jesus' days. People still waiting and longing for the Messiah to finally come. Now, how do we know this connection is here? Look at me at Revelation 22, verse 16. In Revelation twenty two sixteen, 16, this is the last book of the Bible and the last chapter of the Bible. I mean, this is, this is the last book of the Bible, last chapter. This is the very end of the Bible. And, and the risen, glorified, ascended Jesus and all of his glory and power. You read these words in Revelation twenty two sixteen. 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. Hello. You got it? I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. If you read Matthew 1, Luke chapter 3, you realize in the genealogies that Jesus comes through the line of David. But a th- so, so Nathan is talking to David saying, one day a king's going to come. The king's going to come. He starts, the, the king whose kingdom will be forever. Now, they don't know how long it's going to be. Remember last week we talked about how sometimes you can get impatient. If you're sitting at a restaurant and food takes like more than 15 minutes or 20 minutes, you can get impatient. They were going to wait for a thousand years for the Messiah to come from the time of that prophecy. Last week's prophecy was a few hundred years after that. But for a thousand years, they're awaiting the king whose kingdom will reign forever. We get to look back 2,000 years and see that king and worship that king. So David was a king, but Jesus is the king. So in light of David, and because, because Jesus came through the line of David, because there's a connection there, we can see some of the same things we learn about David's kingship fulfilled completely and ultimately in the king of kings, in Jesus. So Christmas now. King Jesus is the ruler over his church and over his people. Like David was called to be a king at a time to rule over a nation, Jesus is the ruler over his church and all of his people. Do you know that? Do you know that in this crazy world where we have lots of time thinking about who's going who's to be in charge, At the end of the day, we know who's in charge through all history and all time. So we draw from the old, but we live in the now. So here's a question for you. Do you love the church and God's people like our king does? See, Jesus is king and the head over the church. Jesus loves his church. Do you know that? And you're part of his church. If if you've come to the cross and received Jesus, you're part of his church. If you're here today with us online, if you're in the family worship venue out in the courtyard, if you're in the worship center and you're trying to figure out the whole Jesus thing, you're coming to church. You're visiting a church. You're not yet part of the church because you become part of his church when you receive Jesus as your savior. You confess your sins. But if you've done that, you are part of his church. And Jesus loves his church. That's why at Shoreline, listen closely, especially if you're new to the church. We're not in competition with Monterey Church. And the new pastor there, Josiah, who's a great, godly young man, great young leader at Monterey Church. We, I prayed for that church when God called Mike away as their lead pastor. And God brought Josiah. People call him Sai. Great guy. We rejoice in what's happening in that church. What if that church grows? We rejoice. What if people come to faith in that church and not here at Shoreline? We rejoice because we're part of his church. Someone say Amen. This last week I was with the pastors of five different churches in our area that I meet with regularly, that I pray with and talk with and encourage. I love these guys. They're brothers. 
when I drive by Cypress Church on Highway 68 between here and Salinas. I pray for Pastor Ben and his wife, Joni. Ben's the lead pastor there. Joni's his wife. I pray for that congregation. Why? Because Jesus loves his church in all its shapes and forms. Any Bible-believing Christian church that's lifting up Jesus Christ, we should pray for them and love them. Someone please say amen. That's what the church is about. We are part of his church, not our own little thing. All right? So that's Christmas now. Do you love the church like he does? Christmas now. King Jesus protects us with a mighty with his mighty hand. Like, like David saw protection over his kingdom, Jesus protects us. So we draw from the old, but we live in the now. Where do you need the king to protect you today? I don't know what needs you have today. But I know this. You or someone really close to you, you need the protecting hand of God Almighty and of the Messiah in your life. Ask him for his protection. Ask for his presence. Ask for his power. When our service is over today, if you're online, when our service is over, you can, you can go back and forth and, and chat, do a chat with your host online or you can send us prayer needs. If you're, on, if you're here in the worship center on campus, we have people that are gonna be up front here. Not, don't come up front yet. We're not at the end of the sermon yet, but we're gonna have people up front here to pray with you. If you have a need in your life or someone you love and care about that you need the power and the protection of God Almighty, get people praying with you because there's power in prayer. But where do you need God's protection? Cry out to him. Ask him, I believe that every one of us that's a follower of Jesus, when we finally see Jesus face to face, when we stand before him in glory, he's going to just give us a look back and we're going to see all the times he protected us. I try to think through my junior high years and my first two years of high school, the, the number of stupid, insane, dangerous things I did that I didn't get killed a hundred times over. But I believe I'll look back and see even before I was a Christian, God was protecting me. We have no idea how God's watching over us. But understand that he, the Messiah, Jesus, protects us. Christmas now. King Jesus is the name above all names. David received a name, but Jesus has the name. Philippians says, the book of Philippians in the New Testament says, at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. His name has power. His name has authority. So here's the question. Do you walk in the power of that name? Do you walk in the power of the name of the living, risen Jesus Christ? Do you walk and live in that power? Do you understand that in his name, there is power? When you're afraid to say the name of Jesus, listen closely, not like, uh, like a magic charm. It's not that. When you know the name, when you live under the authority of his name, in his name you stand. And in his name there's authority and power. I'd been a Christian about a year and a half when this young guy who had, was just investigating the Christian faith, a young guy named Gavin, I'd shared Jesus with him. He hadn't become a Christian yet. But he, we invited him to come to a youth camp. He came to the youth camp. And at that camp, he was under, it turns out, I don't know even how all this works, but he was under a sort of demonic attack. And the last day of the camp, when we were going to have an invitation to receive Jesus, he comes walking up to me, tries to talk, and it's like somebody was physically strangling him, but he couldn't, he couldn't talk. He had terror in his eyes and anger in his eyes all at once. He turned around and ran away. I was still a pretty new Christian. I grabbed a couple people. I said, pray for me. I don't know what's going on, but I've got to follow him. I chased him down. He'd run down a hall, cut around. He'd gone in a bathroom, and he was cowering like, a, like an afraid dog in a corner. Just looked terrified. And I walked, and, and, and I just, and you know, because I'd read this book, as I'd been a Christian long enough to have read the whole book, I understood the power of the name of Jesus. I walked over to him and I just, and I didn't have any, like, any fancy religious words. I just said, in Jesus' name, get out of him and leave him alone. He collapsed. He passed out. For about an hour, he was out. They got doctors in from the camp. And he basically afterwards said that there, that there was like this voice telling him to kill me, to go up on the stage and do horrible things and just all this going through his mind. And so he decided he'd accept Jesus because he realized he didn't want that mess of the world in his life and became a transformed person. Not immediately over time. But, but I watched at just the, I, I, I said, in Jesus' name, you leave him alone, get out of here. And whatever powers were, they had to leave. Not because I said it, because of the name. Because of the power of the name, amen? So, so do, you, do you live knowing the power of the name of Jesus? If you've been saved by him, walk in that power, live in that power, and speak in that power, all right? Christmas now. King Jesus is preparing us an eternal home. 
He's preparing a place for us. David was able to provide a land for the people for a while, but Jesus is preparing an eternal load, uh, an eternal home. So draw from the old, but live in the now. Does the hope and promise of heaven bring you peace in this life? Do you live in this life knowing that the King of kings and the Lord of lords has won? He has conquered and he's gone. Read read John chapter 14, the beginning of John 14. He's gone ahead of you to prepare a place for you so that where he is, there you can be also. Jesus is preparing a place for you forever. That's the King. That's the King, the Messiah we celebrate at Christmas time. Christmas now. King Jesus knows all our flaws and he came to save us. He knows your flaws. God knew David's flaws. God knew Solomon's flaws. He still used them. God knows your sin. God knows your flaws. God knows everywhere you've messed. He knows all of it. And he still loves you enough to send his only son to die on a cross for you. That's love. That's the message of Christmas. That's the hope of salvation. So here's my question. As we draw from the old, but live in the now. Have you received his amazing grace? and his lordship, his leadership in your life. Have you received Jesus? And if you haven't, my prayer is that this Christmas season, keep coming to Shoreline through this Christmas season. If you're online, keep coming online. If you're local, join us on campus if you want to, but but stick with us through the Christmas season. I, I want you to say, God, if you're there and if what Jesus did is real and if what I'm hearing is real, I want to know this, Jesus. Keep your heart open because in this Christmas season, we're going to invite you to respond and to receive Jesus when your heart is ready. And one more thought. Christmas now. King Jesus will rule and reign forever. The prophecy that came from God Almighty through Nathan the prophet to David and then about David and mentioning Saul and Solomon, the three kings that were the kings over the United Kingdom of Israel that whole time in history. God was God over all that. But there will come a king whose kingdom will never end. His reign and rule will never end. King Jesus will rule and reign forever. So here's the closing question. Do you live under his lordship today and for eternity? Do you understand that he is the king of kings, that he is the Lord of lords? The only one you should bow your knee to is Jesus. And you should bow your knee to him again and again and again. Is he Lord of your life, the leader of your life? And here's my final challenge for you. Would you quiet your heart right now whether you're online or on campus, just quiet your heart right now. Let's just bow our heads. Let's quiet our hearts. And would you say, Lord Jesus, and this is for those of you that have received him, that that you have accepted his grace, that you are his follower, whether you're a brand new Christian or been a Christian for decades. Would you say, Jesus, this Christmas season, show me one area of my life where I'm not bowing my knee to you where I'm not surrendered to you as the leader, as the Lord of my life. Jesus, you are the king of all kings. You are the Lord of all lords. And I want to surrender all of my life to you. So pray this prayer to him. Jesus, if you will show me an area that I'm holding on to, that I'm stubborn about, that I keep living in a way that I know is not what you want, if you will show it to me right now, if you'll convict me in my heart, or in the coming days, if you'll put a picture in my mind of what needs to change, because you are the Messiah, because you are the King, I want to bow my knee to you in that area. I want to surrender that area to you. I want to turn away from that sin and turn my heart towards you. Jesus, we pray this Christmas season that we will declare with all of our heart that you are the King, that you are the Messiah. But we dare to also pray and cry out that you are my King, You are my Messiah. And I bow my knee and my heart and my life to you for your glory, for the sake of your kingdom and for my good. Help me to do this. I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, before I invite you to stand for a word of blessing, two invitations. One is that we, we've got the volunteer lunch happening. So all the stuff in the courtyard, that's about the volunteer lunch. If you're a volunteer that's, that's been signed up for that, is coming, go have a nice breakfast, whatever you do, but come back. We're going to have a lunch for you, uh, a special gift for everybody. So it's going to be a great time. We'll see you at 1230 if you've, been, if you've signed up to be part of that volunteer time. And also night of worship this, this coming Wednesday, 615. Be here, invite a friend. It's going to be amazing and a great time of worship together. If you need prayer, 
uh, just come forward after the service. Anywhere on campus, come up front here. And again, if you need to see the power of God unleashed in your life, prayer is a great way to get there. Come forward for prayer after the service. If you're online, uh, either, either have a chat with your host and share your prayer need, and they'll pray for you via chat. Or you can send, email your prayer needs and we'll be praying for you. And finally, if you're new, if you're new online, just text the word welcome and we want to give you a digital connection card and get to know you wherever you are. You matter to us. We want to connect with you the best we can. So fill out that digital connection card. If you're on campus, just go by the connection center and pop in there and just tell them you're new. And they will give you a warm welcome and let you know they're glad you're here. If you're able to stand, physically able, would you stand with me? Online, stand with me. Courtyard, please stand with me. Family worship venue. And will you just quiet your heart, turn your hands like you're going to receive a delicious treat or a nice little gift or something. Just kind of like put your hands like you're going to receive something that you really want to hold on to and receive this blessing. Let your, hearts be a pic- let your hands be a picture of your heart. As we go from this time, may the king, the king of all kings, the one whose kingdom rules forever, fill your heart and fill your life and guide every step you take. May you bow your knees and your heart to Jesus all Christmas season and all year long for his glory, for his sake, and for the sake of his kingdom that lasts forever and ever. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you Wednesday night at 6.15. Have a great day. The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior.